Open your Bibles, if you will, tonight to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number 12. David Gearhart has got my attention tonight. I prayed him all the way from the back roll down to the second roll, and I noticed he slipped back tonight about half ways. What's happened, David? <laughs> you didn't think I'd catch that, did you? Amen. Genesis chapter 12. I was trying to get him up in the choir. I don't think he ever made it that far. Genesis chapter 12. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Ask the Lord to add his blessing to his word tonight, and then we'll share a few verses. Father, I thank you tonight for the good, sweet spirit that is here in our midst. Thank you for the good song service. I pray now that the same Holy Spirit that is bore witness with the singing, the Lord will be upon this preacher tonight as I stand here and try to preach and to be a blessing. I pray your spirit and your power might quicken our mind and our thinking tonight. And may we yield ourselves to the control of the Holy Spirit as we preach. And may we say the things, Lord, that you would have us to say. And then, Lord, I pray the things we'll say will be a blessing and be a help unto those that have come this way tonight. I ask you, Lord, to bless during the invitation. Do what needs to be done in each and every life. And we'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 12. Let's read from verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Abram passed through the land and the place of Sechem under the plain of Morai, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, Ai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on, still toward the south. There was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. I'm going to stop reading in verse number 10. The remaining part of the chapter has to do when Abram went, Abraham went down into Egypt trying to escape the famine, famine and put his wife, Sarah, up to lie. He said, uh, Pharaoh's going to look upon you and see that you're a beautiful woman and uh, they'll take my life and take you. So rather than telling them that you're my wife, I want you to tell them that you're my sister. And of course, Pharaoh uh, got the judgment of God upon him for attempting to take Sarah. And then Pharaoh rebuked Abraham for uh, lying about his own wife. I want to take the story tonight of Abraham and I want us to look. I preached last Sunday night, I believe it was, on the three stages of the Christian life. Easy, hard, and impossible. I want us to look at the life of Abraham tonight as as uh, we see it, the progression that was made in the life of Abraham. We call Abraham, he was called in the Bible, the friend of God. He was called in the Bible, the father of the faithful. And Abraham was known for his faith. But when we read these early years of Abraham 
and then total them up, there was some 19 years in Abraham's life that God was working a process in his life. Now, in a Christian life, salvation, I believe, takes place in an instance. The moment that a person trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they're saved. And they're on their way to heaven. But from the time they're saved to reach that place of maturity and reach that place of real usefulness to the Lord and the service of God, many times there's a process that, that takes place in our life in growing and becoming all that God wants us to become. And I want us to see some things in the life of Abraham. There's quite a bit of ground covered. And I trust that God let me get over the picture of Abraham's life to you and I tonight that we might learn something from it in this growing process and, and the importance of really obeying God. So I want to talk to you tonight about the call of God in the life of Abraham and how that it relates to you and I and look at some of the comparisons and see some of the familiar places in the life of Abraham that we see in our own life. I want to mention, first of all, the call of God in relation to Abraham's salvation. The Bible teaches us that God called Abraham from the Ur of the Chaldees. The word Ur means flame, and Chaldees means destruction. And so God called him from the place of flame and destruction. And that is where God calls every one of us from the place of flame and destruction because if we have not believed on the only begotten Son of God, the Bible teaches us that we're condemned already. We're already under the sentence of death because of sin and the end result is, is going to be the judgment of God upon uh, uh, sinners that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. That judgment is hell. That judgment is ultimately the lake of fire. And God calls every one of us from a place of flame and destruction. Now, you can search the scripture in looking at the life of Abraham and you can try to come up with a reason and you can try to find a reason tucked away somewhere in between the verses or in between the lines or whatever, but you won't come up with anything other than just simply the grace of God. Why did God choose Abraham? You won't find it in the Bible you won't find any real significant reason in the Bible as to why out of all the people of this earth that God chose Abraham to call Abraham from the place of flame and destruction and make him the father of many nations and uh, through all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him other than just the grace of God. I'll tell you something else you won't find. If you look in your own life, you won't find a reason why God chose you other than the grace of God. Amen? You won't find it. I thought about this and pondered it in my heart as I was sitting over there in the office this afternoon. And, and, and I mean, to think that God would save somebody like me, I couldn't come to no other conclusion other than it's just the grace of God. Plus nothing, minus nothing, just the grace of God. And so God called Abraham from the place of the Ur of the Chaldees, the place of flame and destruction, and it was solely his grace that uh, chose Abraham and called Abraham. And every one of us tonight can easily identify with that, that it is only by his amazing, marvelous grace that we're saved for no other reason. I mean, can we, what did we have? Nothing to offer God. As the song said, nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross that I cling. And the grace of God is the only thing that we can accredit our salvation to. But then there's a second thing in relation to the call of God in Abraham's life. And this is what we're going to center most of the message around tonight. And that is he not only called him to salvation, but he called him to separation. And we're going to see tonight the, the importance of fully obeying God when God calls us and when God instructs us anything short of full obedience to what God says is going to leave us short 
of the full blessing of God upon our life. Now go back with me to verse one for a moment. The Bible said, now the Lord had said, past tense. That's past tense. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now what did God say unto Abraham? The Lord had already said to him, before we get to chapter 12, he had already said to him, get out of the, thy country and from thy kindred. I want you to come away. You know what the Bible teaches us in the New Testament? Come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. He went on to say in 2 Corinthians 6, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters and so forth. But God called Abraham to a place of separation. And we go back to chapter 11 for a moment, and we're going to find that Abraham did not fully obey God. But do you know who all was included in this? Look in verse 31 of chapter 11. And Terah, this is Abram's father, took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, uh, his son's son, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from the Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. God told Abraham, he said, Abraham, I want you to leave your country and your kindred, and I want you to go into a land that I will tell you, and I will show thee. And uh, he went on to talk about he was going to make of him a great nation. nation. He was going to bless him and uh, make his name great. And he said, I will bless them that bless you, curse them that curse thee, and so forth. But Abraham didn't fully obey God. Now he left the earth of the Chaldees, but he didn't fully obey God and leaving behind his country and kindred. And we're going to see in this story as it unfolds and develops before us, we're going to see some very familiar sights along the way that you and I can identify with that will, that will speak to you and I about what it costs not to fully obey God. And I cannot stress the importance tonight in the life of a Christian about this matter of obedience unto the Lord. And if for no other reason, you do it for the same reason my dad used to say. When I say, why, Dad? He'd say, because I said so. That's why. And what he was telling me was, I didn't need a reason. If he said do it, just do it. And I want to tell you, there's some things in the Bible that God says that we do it simply because God said to do it. And it is important. You say, well, preacher, why did God say for him to leave country and kindred? I don't know, but it's important for Abraham to do it because God said to do it. But he didn't do it, and he took his father along with him. He took Lot along with him, and they got to Haran and dwelt there. Now, what is the significance to that? Well, if you have a Scofield reference Bible, uh, in, in right at the top of the page it gives us the definition of Abraham's father's name. You know what his name means? It means delay. God had a mission for Abraham to call him from the place of flame and destruction and into the land of Canaan, a place flowing with milk and honey that God was going to give him and here he is in, in, in less than full obedience to God and he brings along delay with him. And it is not without significance that the Bible says they stopped off in verse 31 and they came, I mean chapter 11, they came unto Haran and dwelt there. That is halfway to Canaan. And it is not without significance that the name Haran means dry and parched and fruitless. Here's the picture I'm trying to draw. God saves us from something to something. He has a purpose and a place for every one of our lives. Canaan was the place that God had called Abraham to. But here he is being uh, called from the place of flame and destruction. And instead of going all the way where God had called him to, he stops off in Haran. He brought his father along with him, which means delay. And here he is delayed halfway between 
the will of God and where he come from, and he's in a dry and a parched land. Sound familiar? God saves every person to bring them from a life of flame and destruction, to bring them to a place of Canaan, the place of victory and maturity in their Christian life. But many of them tonight, like Abraham, because of flesh and family and friends that they've brought along with them that they can't get loose from, it has caused them to halt halfway from the perfect will of God in their life and they're dwelling in a dry and a parched and a fruitless situation in their Christian life life many many Christians tonight their life is dry and barren and fruitless and they have fallen short of reaching the ultimate will of God for their life and their life is miserable now I, listen Abraham could rejoice as he dwelt here in Haran this dry barren place he could rejoice over the fact that he had been delivered from the Ur of the Chaldees. He could rejoice over the fact that someday when he died, he is going to heaven. But there wasn't much going on at the present. Do you know tonight there's a lot of Christians they can rejoice over the fact they've been saved from a Christless hell. They can rejoice over the fact that someday they're going to heaven when they die or when Jesus comes. But for right now, they're about as miserable as you can get. They're a bad advertisement on Christianity, I'll tell you that. Amen? But I want to tell you something. Listen, folks, I found out that when God saves us, he saved us to bring us to the place of the ultimate will of God for our lives in a place of Canaan that is flowing with milk and honey. Sure, we're saved from hell. Sure, we're going to heaven. But I want to tell you, I found out you can enjoy Jesus in between on the way. Amen? We can enjoy it in the middle, on the way. We, listen, we can enjoy it before we get to heaven. We don't have to be dry, barren, parched, fruitless, miserable. We can enjoy the Lord on the way. And here he was. He's, he has stopped off. He's at a standstill. And six years of his life goes by. And he has not fully obeyed God. Go back to chapter 12 with me for a moment. Back in chapter 12, Abraham reaches the place. Before we get to chapter 12, look in verse 32, just across the page in chapter 11 for a moment. Down in the latter part of that verse, and Terah died. Delay died in Haran, that dry and parched land. And then the Bible says in verse number 4, chapter 12, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Six years of his life went by. Delay died. And he makes an effort now to reach the place that God had called him to. But... You notice in verse 4, the Bible said, Lot went with him. Now keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to look at it again in a moment, and it's going to have some significance to it. So here he goes. He comes down in verse number 5. Abram took Sarah, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered. Now notice this. And the souls that they had gotten in Haran. They collected some things down there in that dry and parched land. There's a lot of things get a hold of us when we're living a defeated Christian life, halfway the will of God. Do you know that? that? That tag along, it takes us years to get rid of sometimes. But the Bible said, down in verse number five, the latter part of the verse, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now here he is, he's going to make an effort. He's going to make an effort to enter the land of Canaan where God had called him to, to begin with, having spent six years halfway in a dry and a barren land, he's going to make an effort now to, to go on to the land of Canaan. So into the land of Canaan they came. Look in verse 6. Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem 
under the, under the plain of Moriah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. That place, Shechem means, I keep wanting to put an H in there because it's spelled a different way in a different place of the Bible, but it means a place of shoulder or strength. He comes to the place of strength in the plain of Morah. Morah means the place of instruction. So he comes to the place of strength. God gives him strength. And God gives him instructions. And then in verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, I will give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mount on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west, Hai on the east, and there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Bethel is the house of God. By the way, the Lord's instructions always lead you to the house of God. He come to the place of strength, instruction. He ended up at the house of God, and here's what he does. Ai means defeat. And that's exactly what he had done for six years. He had dwelt in defeat, halfway to the will of God, dry, barren, and parched land. And here's what he's doing. He's come to the land of Canaan, the place of strength, the place of instructions that has brought him to the house of God. He turns his back on Ai, faces Bethel, the house of God, builds an altar unto the Lord, and calls upon the name of the Lord. And that's good. That's good. He's making an effort now. And I believe in the heart of Abraham that after spending six years in Haran and he finally comes to Bethel, he turns his back on Ai, defeat, that he has come to the place that a lot of Christians come to that I see over the years. They realize they're halfway to the will of God. The land they're in is dry and barren and fruitless and they make an honest effort to draw strength from the Lord and to listen to his instructions and turn their face to the house of God and turn their back on defeat and go all the way with the Lord. But wait a minute. Abraham, like a lot of Christians that I've seen, make the same mistake. Remember I said Lot was still with him? You remember I said it was going to play some significance? Here he is now. He's finally reached that place where God wanted him. He's in the land of Canaan. And he's tried to draw strength and he's tried to, to receive instructions from the Lord and he's turned his back on the feet and turned his face toward the house of God and built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. But Lot's still with him. Now watch this. Look in verse 10. And there was a famine in the land... And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. You know what Egypt is, don't you? That's the world. It states it very clearly that he went down. Anytime you go to Egypt, it's downhill. Why in the world, having finally got to Canaan, having made an honest effort, to draw strength from the Lord, receive instructions from him, turn his face to the house of God, his back on the feet, and call upon the name of the Lord. And now he's faced with his first test. There's a famine in the land, and you know what he does? He fails that test miserably. Why? He still had Lot with him. You know what Lot means? You know what the name Lot means? It means veil. It means veil. You know what a veil does? A veil covers your face, it covers your eyes. So when Abraham was put to the first test, instead of him seeing God and seeing the provisions of God, all he saw was a famine and he went down. Now I've seen this process. I don't know if I'm getting this out of my heart the way God's put it in there or not, but I've seen this process happen in the lives of Christians over and over for the years that I've been a pastor. I've seen people like Abraham get saved. I've seen some of them stop off halfway to the will of God and dwell in an old, defeated, dry, barren, fruitless life. And then I've seen them try to sell out and go all the way with God and get to the land of Canaan, but they keep on dragging things. God, 
has told them to leave alone and leave behind. They keep on dragging that with them. And what happens then when they get over here to the place of strength and instruction and the house of God and they really want to do something for the Lord, they've still got this baggage along that God said to leave behind and it becomes a veil to them. And the first test they face, they don't see God, but they see the wrong thing and they fail miserably. And down they go again. Can y'all identify what I'm preaching? Here he is going down. Now, we read from chapter 12 to chapter 13. The first verse of chapter 13 says, And Abraham went up out of the land of Egypt. And that kind of sounds like that Abraham saw famine. He wanted to get away from the famine, so he just go down to the land of Egypt and, uh, you know, and, and sojourn there, temporary bases. And then he'd come up out of there back to the land of Canaan again and so forth. But what we don't see in this when you study it is that Abraham spends 13 long years in Egypt. Out of the will of God. A lot of things take place during this time that's in this story. And I'm trying to be sensitive to the Lord to leave out I can't preach it all and try to leave out what the Lord wants me to leave out and say what the Lord wants me to say. But he went down to Egypt and those 13 years that he spent down there in Egypt, surprisingly as it may sound, he prospered. He was a successful businessman while he was down there and he prospered and he gained herds and cattle and sheep and flocks and made lots of money while he was down in Egypt. But the sad thing about it is the Lord never spoke to him the whole time he was there. There's a false philosophy being preached in our day about this prosperity gospel. And it has got people to thinking as long as they're making money and they're successful in the world, that that must mean God's blessing them and God's approving of everything they're doing. I want to tell you, that's not necessarily so. Amen. I know a lot of folks that don't know where their next meal's coming from that loves God and sold out to Jesus. And I know some that could buy this place that loves God and sold out to Jesus. And all of us in it at the same time. And they're sold out to Jesus. But you don't ever judge anything by the world's standards. Abraham spent those years down there. Now listen, while he's down there, even though God hasn't spoke to him and God hasn't appeared to him, the hand of God is still on his life and the providence of God is still at work in his life. And if Abraham won't do what God has told him to do, God will, he will arrange it so until he'll accomplish what he told Abraham to do. So the Bible said in verse number thir uh, chapter 13, look in verse 1. Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him. Lot's still with him. He still got the veil with him. He spent 13 years in, in Egypt. And the Bible says in verse 2, And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. He went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel under the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. He had to go right back to that place to face the house of God and turn his back on the feet. And here he is. He still has Lot with him. And look in verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now here's God and the providence of God at work. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. For their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Here's the providence of God at, at work, working his will in the life of Abraham, getting to do what he asked him to do to begin with. Now I want you to notice something. You know the story from verses 10 and following down there where Lot chose Sodom and Gomorrah and the plains, the well-watered plains of Jordan and so forth, and he ended up going to Sodom. But I want you to notice something. Now the Lord has not appeared to Abraham since uh, verse number 7 
of chapter 12. Thirteen years has passed since the Lord's appeared to him. And look in verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, notice this, folks, this is not without significance. And the Lord said unto Abram after that Lot was separated from him. Isn't that amazing that God spoke to him after Lot separated from him? That's what he's trying to get him to do to start with, get rid of the veil. The Lord said unto Abram, After that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, Look from the place where thou art, Northward, southward, eastward, westward, For all the land which thou seest to thee Will I give it into thy seed forever, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, Then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, The length of it, the breadth of it, And I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, came and dwelt in the plain of Mabry, which is in Hebron, and dwelt and built there an altar unto the Lord. He went back up there, same place, Bethel, on the west, Ai on the east. He went up there to the same place, and now he don't see a famine. The veil's gone. He's finally separated from that veil and, and he said, Abraham, I want you to take another look. Same place. And what he saw was the land flowing with milk and honey. He saw the very best that God had. He said, I want you to just look at it from one end to the other, the length, the breadth, the depth of it. I want you to arise and walk through the land and every place that you see, that have I given unto you. I've given you this land. Abraham saw things altogether different. I don't take the time to do word studies much in my preaching because I'm always in too big a hurry. Maybe I should sometimes. But all these names and places are not without significance. When he ended up going back there, look in verse 18. The plain of Mabry. 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 You know what that means? Fatness. Well, the last time Abraham was up there, he saw a famine. Now it's fatness. <laughs> and, and which is in Hebron. And the word Hebron there means place of association and fellowship. Instead of, instead of being miserable in the famine... He could have enjoyed the fatness of the land in fellowship with the Lord. I know many Christians tonight, they've stopped off halfway, dry, barren, parched, fruitless land like Haran was. I know many tonight that's made an effort to get to the land of Canaan, but they've drug along the excess baggage. They still have the veil over their face and they can't see the goodness of God. But I want to tell you, folks, there's a place of fatness and fellowship for the Christian who will sell out, cut his ties behind him, burn his bridges behind him, separate from the system of this world and dedicate his life to Jesus and find out what it's like to live in Canaan right now. You can do it. Sometimes... I'd like to just take Christians and just say to them, trust me. You won't trust God, trust me. <laughs> trust me and believe what I say. And for one time in your life, cut your ties with this world and, and cut loose, burn your bridges behind you, and for one time in your Christian life, sell out 100% to Jesus and find out what it's like to enjoy the fatness in the fellowship of serving the Lord. You know, there's a lot of Christians going to live and die in this life and have never known what it was. The last time there's 100% Jesus was the day or night they got saved. And they keep dragging all this baggage along behind them. And it's got their eyes veiled and they can't see and they can't believe God. There's no fruit in their life and it's dry and barren and they're miserable. Folks, I want to tell you there's nothing any more blessed than, than serving Jesus. I don't want the world to feel sorry for me. I don't want the world to feel sorry for me. I'm having the time of my life serving the Lord. I don't feel like I'm being deprived. 
I'm living in a place of fatness and fellowship. Amen. I'm living in a place of association and fellowship with the Lord. I found out that Canaan's not heaven. I don't have to die to get there. I found out that Canaan can be victory right now. We talk about Canaan. Canaan's not heaven. People talk about Canaan is, is heaven, you know, and, 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 and all that. Well, listen, there were still enemies over there in Canaan when they got there, and there's still battles to be fought, but there's victories to be won. The land was flowing with milk and honey and the grapes and the pomegranates and and, and all the blessings of the Lord was flowing over there. I know a lot of Christians just need to find out that it's worth fighting the giants for the blessings that you enjoy. Sure, there's giants in the land of Canaan. But there's also victory there in the land of Canaan. This process, as I said, it looks like an overnight thing when we read it on the pages of Scripture. But there was a 19-year span of time that took place in Abraham's life from the time God called him until he reached that place. There was a 19-year span of time in there that God was working in his life, bringing him to the place to really ultimately reach the place that God had called him to. Now listen, I know none of us are perfect, and it's not an overnight thing. God's been working on me a long time. But I want you to know my sights are on Canaan. I don't want to stop off in a dry and barren and miserable place halfway to the will of God. I want to live my life sold out to the Lord in the center of His will, the place of fatness and fellowship with the Lord. I want to ask you a question tonight. Where do you stand with the Lord in your Christian life? I hear people make statements, well, well, you know, old Brother Berman, he's a preacher and, you know, and he pastors a church and he's full-time pastor and, and all he's got to do is serve the Lord. And they'll look at Brother Junior, you know, and, and so forth, and they'll say, if they had a job, <laughs> somehow that sounds kind of funny to me when people say, if they had a job, they'd feel different about this. <laughs> and the old devil sit there and tell you that that what I'm preaching is impossible for you to live up to because you have a job and you're not full. You've got other things to think about and other things to do besides just serve the Lord. Well, listen, folks, I got a job. <laughs> I got a big job, in fact. I got a job bigger than I am. I get just as busy as you do sometimes. Now, there's difference in... I mean, you talk about the service of the Lord and the, and, and the task of pastoring this church right here and serving the Lord. Though they may be closely related sometimes, and whether you, whether, you can, uh, whether you can find it in your heart to believe this or not, sometimes I get caught up with all the duties of this church, and my personal relationship with the Lord suffers because of it. I know what it is to get too busy for the Lord. So whether you work an 8-to-5 job or whether you're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the kind of job that I have. Somewhere in all of that, you need to find time to serve Jesus. Regardless of where you work, Jesus can still be first in your life. You can, go, you can punch a clock in the morning and, and still Jesus can be the number one priority in your life. I mean, it's like Bill Moody said one time. He was a shoe salesman when he got saved. You know, and, uh, and, and then he started preaching and conducting Sunday school classes in Chicago for little children. That's how the Moody Church got started. He run a bus, he run a, run a uh, bus ministry. Somebody said he had the first bus ministry. He used to give children nickels uh, to ride his horse and wagon to Sunday school. But he said one time, he said, hey, he said, uh, that fellow over there, he's a, he's a Christian shoe salesman. He said, no, I'm a Christian that sells shoes. Hey, Amen. He, he wasn't just a shoe salesman that was a Christian, but he was a Christian that sold shoes. Whatever you do, whatever you do, Jesus ought to be first in your life. 
If you want to find out what it's like to enjoy the fatness of the land of Canaan and enjoy the fellowship with the Lord, put Jesus first in your life. I, 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 won't, I don't know how to make a proposition of what I'm going to make. I'm going to ask Brother Tom to come and get a song ready. I'm not preaching three or four workings of grace. When you get saved, you get all. Some of you just need to find out what all you got saved into, I guess, by the way it is. But I believe with all my heart, these Christians right here in this building tonight, that you can identify with what I've preached. You're saved and as sure for heaven as you can be. You're not out here in the world drinking liquor and chasing women. And being unfaithful to your wife or your husband, robbing and stealing and cheating. You, you love the Lord, but you've never really sold out and really put Jesus first in your life. I'm talking about before family, friends, before the flesh. I'm talking about selling out to the Lord and really putting Jesus first in your life and really enjoy the fatness and the fellowship of Canaan. And I believe with all my heart tonight, if if people are obedient to the Lord, they'd be some Christians in this place tonight. Saved you may be, but God's brought you to the place in your Christian life where you need to arise and go to Canaan. And just come, get on your knees and say, Lord, I want, I want to sell my life out to you. I want to yield my life 100% to you. Once in my life, in my Christian life, before I die, I want to live my life 100% for you. That don't mean to go to work tomorrow and turn in your resignation. That don't mean you ain't got time for do nothing but read your Bible and pray all the time to do that. I'm just talking about that wherever you're at, whether you're, if you're in a grocery store, first of all, you're a Christian. If you're on a job tomorrow, first of all, you're, you're a Christian. It mean, just means that Jesus is Lord of your life wherever you're at, whatever you're engaged in. Would you listen to him tonight? If God's dealing with your heart in that area, would you be obedient to him? And God will bless you. And I pray that you will come to know the fatness and the fullness of fellowship with the Lord that he wants you to have. Father, take the message tonight. And Lord, sometimes it, it seems as though you put a message in our heart and it's in just no time it seems to get bigger than we are. And we have a, seemingly a hard time trying to get it over and to get it out of our heart where people can understand what we've tried to preach and what we've tried to say. I pray tonight that you'll take this message, these feeble efforts, and may the Holy Spirit of God make it clear what we're trying to say. And Lord, may there be Christians tonight that have fallen these altars in a moment and yield their life totally and completely to the control of Jesus Christ and know what it is to live in victory the land of Canaan flowing with milk and honey. Have your way in this invitation. If there's people here that's never trusted Jesus, that have never been saved, help them to come tonight and trust Jesus. And we'll thank you for it because it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.